It's November 1996. A bomb explodes in Kaspisk, a small working-class city on the Russian coast, near the Caspian Sea. Located in the country's southernmost region, we're closer to Iraq and Iran than to Moscow. The huge blast tears through an apartment building that houses members of the fisheries police. The officers keep a close eye on fishermen, making sure that they pay their taxes. It's an impossible task in this far-flung corner of a vast country that's plagued by corruption. And it's about to get worse. Once the flames are extinguished, rescuers sift through the rubble for survivors. They find 68 people, including women and children, dead. Russia's president, Boris Yeltsin, declares a national day of mourning. Some sources blame the deadly bombing on separatists from the neighboring country of Chechnya, but no one in Kaspisk actually believes this. Today, more than 25 years later, residents have long given up hope that the perpetrators will be brought to justice. They still believe that the bombing had less to do with Chechen independence and more to do with sending a message. We're taking a quick detour from Missouri, but this story is related to our paddlefish in Warsaw and our mission to work out who was brutally killing them to steal their eggs. Before we can answer the who, we first need to understand the why. How and when did fish eggs first become so valuable? We need to understand caviar's origin story. We're in Soho, the bustling and cosmopolitan district right in the center of London. Outside, the streets are filled with people, a mix of young and old, spilling out of pubs and restaurants, enjoying the summer sun. We're right next door to Ronnie Scott's, London's legendary jazz and blues venue that played host to Jimi Hendrix's last performance ever. My name is Alexei Zimin. I'm from Russia, I'm from Israel too, I'm a chef in a Russian restaurant in London called Zima, like my surname. Zima Restaurant is London's best Russian restaurant. Its walls are adorned with folk art and peasant images by famous Russian artists, an oasis of calm from the bustle outside. It serves classic Russian dishes with a modern twist. From pelmeni dumplings with lamb to pan-fried sturgeon with burnt cauliflower, and of course, caviar. Alexei Zeman is Zima's owner and one of Russia's most celebrated chefs. He's known for transforming Moscow's culinary scene over the past 15 years. He used to edit Russia's most prestigious food magazine, and until May of this year, was a television personality. But his cooking show was canceled after he spoke out against the war in Ukraine. In Zima, every day is a New Year party. The menu of Russian New Year parties is uh, if you want something nostalgic, you come in and find it here. I've come to do a caviar tasting, but it just so happens that we're speaking the day after the death of the last leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, who ruled from 1985 until the country's dissolution in 1991. The end of communism was a huge leap into the unknown for Russia, but it wasn't just about the end of the Cold War. For many Russians, there was genuine hope that the arrival of capitalism would change ordinary people's lives for the better. When the first McDonald's opens in Moscow's Pushkin Square in January 1990, 38,000 Russians lined up for hours beneath the glowing golden arches for something they had heard of but never tasted, a McDonald's hamburger. This moment of innocence was before greedy oligarchs took control of state-owned assets and caused economic chaos and rampant corruption. Alexei remembers the final years of the Soviet Union. I remember the time of the Gorbachev leadership. Uh, no food at all <laughs> in shops, 
five years without food and alcohol. But even as living standards plummet, he says that one food remained abundant right up to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Every Russian, if you ask him or her, say, in my childhood, many kilos of caviar was in our home. I don't know if it's true or not, but every Russian say it to you if you ask. Usually we eat it uh, with blinis, but I like to eat it with uh, sour products, uh, soft cheese, sour cream, or something like this, because it's a very good pairing. Alexei gestures for a waiter to bring over a small tin of caviar. Etc. At a Siberian etc. A small fish, around three kilos. This is one of the highest quality caviars there is. Maybe less salt will be better, but it's not, not bad. If you, if you add some sour cream or something, it will be better. A Cetra caviar has one of the larger grain sizes, 3.5 millimeters, or just over an eighth of an inch, to be exact. The color varies from gray to golden platinum, and this tin we're looking at is one of the most beautiful dark green hues of platinum I've ever seen. This is the good stuff. First, you drink vodka, and after, eat. My producer, Aaron, is trying caviar for the first time. Wow. I can't tell if he actually likes it. It's really briny and salty. Caviar is kind of being with God. It's a taste of money. I'm Helen Holliman. From Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci, this is the Paddlefish Caviar Heist. Episode 3. Expensive taste. Amazon Music presents Cold, the search for Cherie. Cherie Warren left her job in Salt Lake City on a chilly October night in 1985. She told a co-worker she was going to meet her estranged husband, Charles Warren, at a car dealership, but she never made it. Cherie vanished. And when her car mysteriously surfaced weeks later, hundreds of miles away in Las Vegas, no one could say how it got there. Police turned suspicious eyes towards the husband. And although there was distrust towards Charles Warren, he wasn't the only suspect when Cherie went missing. She also had a boyfriend, a former cop named Carrie Hartman. And he lived a sinister double life. Season three of Cold follows two suspects, men who both raise suspicion for investigators. This season, host Dave Cauley digs into the lives of these two men, the details of the case, and examines the intersections between domestic abuse and sexual violence. Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Cold, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers. And Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. My first experience of caviar was at a trade fair, the Royal Highland Show in Edinburgh, and was given a huge piece of toast with an enormous spread of caviar on top of it. That was the first time I tried caviar, and I was totally blown away by it. It was just the most amazing flavour, physical sensation. Nicola Fletcher is a food writer and historian who has literally written the book on caviar. I just sort of stood there in a bit of a daze for a while. I was supposed to have taken this back to share with my husband, but I'm ashamed to say he never got any of it at all. I ate the lot. To understand how caviar went from being a food found in every Russian home, apparently measured by the kilogram, 
to becoming one of the world's most glamorous and expensive delicacies, we need to go back in time. Way back, before the Soviet Union. One of the earliest records of anybody talking about it goes back to the 3rd century BC, where Aristotle comments on it. And he talks about the remarkable quality of sturgeon eggs. Greek philosopher Aristotle ate caviar at banquets as early as the 4th century BC. The next time it appears is almost a thousand years later, during the Byzantine era, in a poem in which caviari is described as a luxury dish in Constantinople, in modern-day Turkey. It's also around this time that caviar starts performing a religious role in medieval Russia. It was decided by both the Greek and the Russian Orthodox churches that caviar would be a suitable food for people to eat during fast days when they weren't allowed to eat any meat. In the 13th century, the church governs even the smallest aspects of Russian life. Orthodox Christians are told to go without meat for as many as 200 days out of the year. It's a good, nutritious food that poor people could eat as well as rich people and very widely available. So at that point, it's where it really took off as a food, particularly for Russian people, because the rivers in Russia, in particular the Volga River, which is the most famous sturgeon caviar river in Russia, was absolutely teeming with fish. So how does it grow from these humble beginnings into luxury? It was a gradual process of caviar becoming more and more associated with rich and wealthy and glamorous people, you know, starting with the czars. You've probably heard of Catherine the Great or Ivan the Terrible. These czars, a title that means emperor, rule Russia with an iron fist from the Middle Ages right up until the Bolshevik Revolution. To begin with, it wasn't the caviar so much as the actual sturgeon fish that was the thing that excited people. And people would give kings and princes would give each other gifts of an enormous sturgeon. But it was only really in Russia that the caviar started to take off. There was a czar in the 17th century who quashed a Cossack rebellion. He was called Tsar Alexei. The Cossacks are a semi-nomadic tribe of fearless fighters and competent fishermen who live on the banks of Russia's plentiful rivers. Well, I suppose so that he wouldn't kill them all. They gave him a sort of peace offering of some caviar. And then they thought they'd better carry on doing that just in case he remembered how rebellious they had been. So they carried on doing that. And then it became an annual gift from the Cossacks to the Tsars, to such an extent that by 1868, there were 1,500 court people who were receiving gifts of caviar. By the time Peter the Great becomes Tsar in 1682, sturgeon fishing has grown into a major industry. The demand is massive. Peter the Great who was the one who really started to reach out into Europe, because before that, Russia was really quite a closed sort of country, a bit like it sadly has become again today. And so he would serve caviar at all his state banquets and all the rich and famous and royalty would come and appreciate that. That is where it started becoming a sort of royal noble dish. In the 18th century, Tsar Peter is itching to modernize Russia's reputation abroad. And that means cozying up to France. Peter the Great actually was the first one to actually send a gift of caviar to France. And that was to young Louis XV, who was at Versailles at the time. And so this wonderful gift was sent to the friends of Russia. But unfortunately, Louis XV didn't like it very much, and he spat it out on the carpet. So some poor servant at Versailles would have had to scrape all these fish eggs off the carpet. Not the best start. But soon enough, things start looking up. French people decided that caviar was the bee's knees, and that's where the very strong link between France and Russia came from and continued really right up to today. And that's why France is, outside Russia, one of the biggest consumers of caviar. They love it. (laughs) It's Peter's granddaughter, Catherine the Great, 
who becomes the unofficial European ambassador in the caviar game. During her reign, caviar enters the realms of unparalleled luxury. Catherine the Great served these hugely extravagant banquets where people commented on the amount of caviar and jewels, actually, that were laid all over the table. One, I think it was English commentator, saying that he totted it up and reckoned it was worth something like two million pounds sterling, which in the 18th century is quite some sum of money. (laughs) To enjoy this delicacy, the upper classes create special caviar rituals and craft intricate paraphernalia, spoons made from mother of pearl and elaborately carved crystal bowls. Many of these serving utensils are still used today. Fast forward a century or so, and the Industrial Revolution transforms caviar, just like it does everything else. Large-scale fishing operations are suddenly possible, meaning sturgeon populations take a hit. But with the arrival of railways and steam-powered ships, and refrigeration, caviar can travel further, all while arriving fresher than ever before. It therefore needs less salt, leading to a much fresher taste. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast, wherever you listen. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. In 1917, after the Bolshevik Revolution, which sees an end to Tsarist rule and the arrival of communism, the new Soviet Union is hoping to embrace collective work for the common good. Making sure that caviar is available to everyone is seen as an important measure for these new communist ideals. And by that time, it was such an elitist thing that the poor people couldn't really afford it so much. So when the Soviets came into power, they wanted to make it available for everybody. By the 1930s, a tin of caviar only cost twice as much as butter. So if you're a nurse in Leningrad, you can eat government-subsidized caviar sandwiches for lunch. And the Soviets were very keen, obviously, on any time any foreign visitor came, you know, they would get caviar thrown at them in great copious quantities. Caviar and champagne. So, you know, it was all part of Stalin's life is good, my friends. Life is joyous, comrades. Our top story. The Iron Curtain between East Germany and West Berlin has come tumbling down. In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lured for the last time. And an era comes to an end. I originally come from Ukraine. I was educated in Europe and ended up teaching in the U.S. Yulia Zabalina is an associate professor of international criminal justice at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. Back in the day, it was a very common thing that we would have for celebrations, mostly red caviar, but also black. Black has always been more expensive in the times when I was growing up. Back in the day, a century ago, that was considered to be peasant food, but things changed very fast. Fast forward again to 1991, and as the Soviet Union collapses, the caviar trade falls prey to organized crime. Illegal exports send caviar prices skyrocketing, while overfishing in the Caspian Sea 
brings sturgeon to the brink of extinction. With a few decades, there was very few fishes left in the Caspian Sea that could be used for the production of black caviar. Caviar poaching in the Caspian had always been lucrative, but in the 1990s, it becomes lucrative and easy. The Russian mafia takes control of the trade and floods the international market with illegal and often low-quality caviar. One study of the New York City caviar market in the mid-90s finds that almost 20% is mislabeled. Some of the groups were heavily armed, so they would actually try to counteract any law enforcement attempts to stop them, and they would do that violently. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, known as CITES, is the closest thing there is to a worldwide environmental protection agency. In the late 90s, CITES pressures the Russian government to accept limits on its caviar exports. Fisheries patrols start to regulate the caviar black market, and suddenly, it's much harder for poachers to get their caviar out of Russia. But just as Russian negotiations with CITES are wrapping up, a huge bomb blasts through an apartment building in Kaspisk. Someone doesn't want the agreement to be signed. Most of those killed in the explosion are Russian border guards and fisheries police. It seems they've made some dangerous enemies. The bombing demonstrates the lengths the Russian mafia will go to to protect their caviar operation. Caviar-related uh, criminal organizations can be violent. They want to protect the criminal activities that they run and also the criminal markets they benefit from. In 1998, when CITES limits the supply of sturgeon, it has the unintended consequence of making caviar even more valuable. A year after the regulations are introduced, the retail price for a pound of good beluga passes the $1,000 mark, the equivalent of several ounces of gold. In the 1990s, people would smuggle caviar in suitcases on a flight from Moscow to New York. It's big business. In the year 2000, a luxury food dealer named Eugene Coxuck is caught trying to circumvent the site's limits. He's found bringing millions of dollars worth of Russian sturgeon roe into the United States from Poland. He does so by paying airline passengers to smuggle precious tins of caviar in their suitcases. Coxuck is sentenced to 20 months in prison, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. With fewer fish than ever left in the sea and international trade restrictions taking hold, Caspian Sea caviar is suddenly even more rare and expensive. But the global demand is still huge. So criminals start turning their attention to alternative sources. This is how Missouri, particularly Warsaw, Missouri, was discovered. Welcome back to Warsaw. In 2010s, there was a temp that paddlefish caviar would be smuggled out of the U.S. to be sold in Europe. So we have this reversal of flows. Back in the day, we had Caspian black caviar smuggled to Europe and then smuggled to the United States to satisfy the demand. And now, with the rise of poaching activity in Warsaw, Missouri, we have this reversal trend that paddlefish caviar would be smuggled to Europe and maybe to Russia. We don't know. As a caviar connoisseur, I wonder how easily Nicola thought it might be to pass off paddlefish roe as the premium stuff. Well, they do say that any product is all in the marketing. I don't think there's very many people around who have tasted a great variety of real caviar. But it's really only the negotiants, as I call them, the traders, the dealers. They're the only ones who really taste lots and lots and lots of different types of caviar and who really have that knowledge, the average person really doesn't. So if you put something in a really smart piece of packaging or serve it up in a really posh restaurant with $100 menu, how would somebody know that that wasn't the real thing? I just don't think they would. Maybe quietly wonder to themselves, well, I wonder what all the fuss is about. And that, of course, is the big problem because... 
the people who are selling the real thing clearly don't want people going around selling stuff that's not the real thing and that's substandard. I think when you get the caviar that really suits you, it has that little something that you can't really put into words. It's the sort of essence of the sea. It sort of goes down into something hardwired inside you. And it's quite a sort of primitive reaction, I think. When we met Rob Farr in the previous episode, he gave us the inside scoop on the bust that happened in Warsaw in the 1980s involving Spanky DeFray. After that, there seemed to be almost two decades of peace on the waters of Warsaw. But what Rob didn't realize when his phone started ringing off the hook in 2009 was that you could draw a straight line between the bombing in Kaspisk and the prehistoric-looking fish in the Ozarks. While Rob Farr broke up a massive ring in the 1980s and warned of a new poaching ring in 2009, he wasn't the guy who launched Operation Roadhouse. We needed a source inside the operation. And thanks to Rob Farr making a few calls, that's exactly what we got. To pull off an investigation of this magnitude and this complexity over basically a three-year time span, over a bunch of different states, is a pretty remarkable accomplishment. We didn't really have a full idea of the scope of it, however, until we got into the Roadhouse investigation and then realized the full extent of the trafficking, the volume of that trafficking around the country and even out of the country. That's next time. The Paddlefish Caviar Heist is a production of Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci and is written and hosted by me, Helen Holliman. For Imperative Entertainment, the executive producer is Jason Hoke. For Vespucci, the executive producers are Daniel Turkin and Johnny Galvin. David Gavi Herbert is executive producer, based on original reporting by David Gavi Herbert. The series producer is Aaron Keller. The story editor is Matt Willis. Thomas Curry is the managing producer. Audio recording by Austin Sizzler at Eastside Studios. Audio mix and sound design by Matt Peaty. Special thanks to Mira Kumar. And special thanks to Nicola Fletcher, whose book Caviar, A Global History, helped with the research for this episode. <laughs>